Hello, Houston. We got launched last time into, into the beginning of our discussion of, of communication, which I'm going to uh, hopefully come pretty close to completing during today's lecture, or we're going to dribble over into the next uh, subject matter. Hope not to do that. So basically what I wanted to do was, was start with talking about some of the links that exist in, in communication, because the, um, as the language grows from the various kinds of communication links that we have to make with each other, um, it turns out that there are a number of different kinds of links that, that normally uh, are involved. Um, we had been talking last time, just as a reminder, about, about uh, some of the problems in, in communication. And now what I wanted to do is to pick up on the existence of linkages that occur between you and I when we're communicating. A conversation, basically, as I'm going to define it, is a two-way link, or as I've already defined it, I should say. Um, when you and I are communicating or you're talking with anybody, there is a, a kind of a measure of, of uh, sy symmetry in that kind of an exchange. You're one half of a total exchange of information information and those messages passing passing back and forth normally require the development of a uh, of a language but but as you know the communication itself is essentially a continuous stimulus response exchange very tightly coordinated, uh, choreographed, if you want to say it, among two people who are talking. And so in that way, two people's, uh, the, the behavior of, of two people become co concerted, uh, cooperative, and, and directed towards some goal, whatever the end point of that particular conversation happens to be. But there's another kind of conversation that we should also talk about, and that has to do with um, what would be basically a one-way communication. There's several examples, if you think about it. Reading a newspaper is one. Um, Beyond that, um, listening to a radio announcer is another example. He or she talks, but you and I can't talk back to them. Well, we can, but they can't hear us. And so it's not an exchange in that particular way. And an, an, announce, an, and an announcer, therefore, is devoid of cues uh, available to a public speaker. Things like laughs, uh, claps, um, the reciprocal interaction with an audience. I've, in fact, done um, this kind of a lecture uh, one time to a camera, and I decided at the time that I would never do it again because such as there is humor, the timing was always off in that because, they, you know, without feedback, you just don't know how to react in a given situation. Um, an archaeologist, as kind of an extreme example, cannot be corrected by his, by his ancestors some time back. Um, so there are various kinds of one-way communication that are involved. Suzanne Langer has a kind of a nice quote in, in summarizing some of this in which she says, between the clearest animal call of love or warning or anger and a human's least trivial word, there lies a whole day of creation or in modern phrase, a whole chapter of evolution. What she's really talking about there is, is language. Uh, and at another extreme in terms of what is not really language, um, one of the more sophisticated studies done in, in the last century was that of Conrad Lorenz, in which he was trying to work with and identify the communication system that is used by bees. When one bee worker finds pollen somewhere out in the general neighborhood, how do the other workers get word of it? Um, and essentially, it turns out that what, what, um, what, what Lorenz was able to, to demonstrate is that the bee, in fact, engages in uh, a, a one-way dance. In fact, let me back up one so you can keep an eye on that for a minute. Um, he, he, the, the bee worker engages in a figure eight shaped dance. The speed with which it's going around is inversely related to uh, the distance to the, the object. In other words, the further the bee has had to flap his body, the slower he wants to dance when he gets home. So there's an inverse relationship there. And the overlap portion of the figure eight in one dimension, if it's on a horizontal surface, in the overlap portion, the bee is walking directly toward whatever distant, whatever direction bees ought to come out of the nest. So distance and direction are communicated very effectively. What's not communicated in that kind of a, an exchange is uh, things like make sure that you're at least 18 feet off the ground because there's a railroad track between here and the pollen. Uncle Harry is on the front end of a Southern Pacific locomotive in San Antonio now. That kind of thing can't be communicated. So really, it's merely a signal system. Uh, the other bees can't even talk back and say, oh yeah, I found better pollen elsewhere. That doesn't happen. You simply get the, the uh, distance and direction to get to the pollen, which is literally hanging right on the body of the bee that's gotten there, performing that, that, uh, that uh, figure eight shaped dance. So essentially, the, the, one of the key elements of, of such language, such communication system, I should say, is redundancy. And essentially, the bees achieve it by simply doing the same dance over and over and over again. And they communicate 
because three or four bees that are following that initial excited worker will learn the dance and they go elsewhere in the nest with some of the pollen having rubbed off on their body and they perform the same figure eight dance. So it's kind of a relay system that is involved. It's communication, but it certainly would be a stretch to call it language based. It's simply sign based and that's all. And it is essentially one way in the, in the format that it's used. Um, in our language, on the other hand, with the redundancy that we have built into it, it is possible for us to break certain kinds of rules. You know, you and I, when, when uh, jousting with each other linguistically, will sometimes use things like double negatives to, to indicate a kind of a lesser intellect than we actually have, various kind of things like that. When we're using, um, when we're using language as the vehicle of communication, and, and some kind of words can, can be, or some kind of time, sometimes the rules of language can be violated, single ones, without destroying the purpose of being able to communicate communicate accurately with one another. Um, language is a rather interesting idea, but it is a cooperative act. Colin Cherry, I found a really nice quote from him um, in which he says, in the country of the blind, the one-eyed human is not a king, he is a gibbering idiot. You have to think about that a little to really understand what he said. But language itself is a social interaction. And if we look at a, trying to cre create a, a model of, of the communication that we're talking about then, uh, the number one element in that is going to be the source. That is the producer, as, as that person is identified. That's the person who initiates or sends the message, sometimes also called the encoder in different kinds of descriptions of this. And encoding is simply the process by which uh, that person engages uh, in converting the deep stream structure in his or her head uh, into the spoken or written message that's being communicated. And that in turn generates a signal, which is the message itself. Uh, the signal is the information that, that is being encoded by the, proceed, the producer for communication from one person to the next. Um, I'm going to disagree with our text authors, uh, White and Lloyd, Dunn and Hammer, in that the signal is not what is transmitted. What is actually, it, it is what's encoded and produced in that situation. Um, whether or not it is communicated depends on proper operation of a number of other pieces in the overall system that I'm modeling here. For instance, you have to have a channel. No channel, no signal is being communicated in, in that situation. And so in, in terms of the overall channel, without the, the overall model, without the presence of a, of a, a channel, uh, communication is simply not going to occur in that, uh, in that example. And the, the um, difficulties with the signal can, can happen in, in a variety of ways. Um, which I'll get back to here in a minute. Oh, well, in fact, I guess I was going to share it with you now. But to show you how the channel can impact what's involved, I've just listed four or five types of signals that can be used. If words are used, the, um, the channel that is almost always used is air, atmosphere, gas, call it what you will um, in that situation. Things like a gesture, a hand wave to somebody, rely on the space between you and somebody else and the fact that you're standing in the light. I mean, you can stand in your bedroom closet any time with the door shut and the, the closet in dark, uh, and it doesn't matter whether you wave to somebody or not. They're not going to see you. They're not going to gesture back and so forth. Uh, so in that case, we do need the light as a component of the space that's separating us. With radio and TV waves, obviously, that is simply communicating over space. Um, we can also use things like gas, such as pheromones, uh, as an example of a sexual attractant that any of us may emit under certain kinds of conditions. And there, essentially, wind and the sense of smell of the recipient uh, becomes a crucial entity in that case. And finally, electricity uh, requires typically um, the use of wires, or if we're talking about radio signals, that's uh, electricity. These, these models are not independent of one another in, in the way in which they operate. Um, and finally, then, we have the, the um, in, in the overall model, we also then have the, the receiver, sometimes also referred to as the, the decoder. This is the person who, who is uh, the intended, or in some cases, the unintended target uh, of the signal. Also, as I said, called the decoder in, in various kind of people, uh, various kind of models. And, and decoding is simply the process in which that person engages uh, to convert the, the original signal that was received back into the intended message that is replicating in his or her own head the deep structure that was, was being mimicked by the person who produced the, the signal in that situation. Notice that basically a breakdown in communication can, can occur at numerous different places along the four, four 
elements of, the, of that particular model. Producer and receiver have to be in agreement, for instance, on the, on the signal and the channel it's going to be used. If you're out on the, the deck of a, a Navy cruiser, waving your arms back and forth as a semaphore output signal, um, if the other person on the other deck is expecting to see a flashlight beeping um, uh, or blinking, uh, it's not going to do a lot for increasing communication accuracy between the two ships. Um, if you look at things like signal detection theory, uh, the signal to noise ratio is a key element in, in whether such elements, such models will in fact work. The signal has to stand out above the, the uh, noise of the channel on which it's operating. A television, nowadays with digital it isn't so much of a problem, but in the older case at your grandparents' house when you used to watch television, remember years ago, if they were at some distance from the center of a city, there would be snow on the screen caused by simply the, the amount of interference that occurs between the TV tower and wherever your parents' set, uh, grandparents' set was actually uh, specifically located. Um, there are some other agreements that also have to occur between the producer and the, and the receiver, and that includes uh, agreement on the language that's going to be used and the meaning of the individual words that are used. All of which then eventually leads to another kind of skill, another way in which we can communicate with each other, and that is reading. Um, as a college student, you should be spending, I presume, several hours a day reading, not just books, but bulletin boards, street signs, newspapers. How is it all done? It's a very complex process, but one of the key things that your eyes are engaged in is what's called saccadic movement. And that's it, it, basically your eyes are capable of two different kinds of movements in, in general, either smooth or jerky. If you follow, uh, put your finger up in front of you or on the screen, follow my finger back and forth. And in that case, when you're following my finger with your eye, you can keep your eye continuously on it. It isn't like you start here and jerk over to here and wait for my finger to get over there. You can simply follow the finger continuously. That's an example of continuous movement. Um, on the other hand, if you read the notes that you're writing in your notebook or the, or the notes on the page on which you're writing, in that case, your eyes engage in, in a jerky movement. Um, and in that case, you're engaged in what's called saccadic movement of your eyes. They jump five to eight letters ahead, uh, five to ten letters ahead, actually, skipping words that offer little information. Words like, for instance, the and a and an and so forth. Um, but if you try to move your eyes smoothly, across an environment, uh, you know, if you take one position and try to move your eyes smoothly across to the other, it, it tends to be very difficult to do. And what you'll do is you're looking at the background un unwillingly or unconsciously, but you'll jerk to a given point, you'll jerk to the next point on the background on the next ground, thinking to yourself, I want to move my eyes smoothly from one to the other. Well, if it's a long distance movement where I'm trying to look from here to another corner of the studio, that's a smooth movement. But in general, um, with reading, it's definitely a jerky movement. And in many cases where we might try to do, for whatever reason, you try to do a, um, a smooth movement. It may not happen as, as, if, as you think it will. When you're reading, it turns out one of the key things that makes a better reader is the ability to take in more units each time your eye stops. So as you're scanning across a line, hopping across a line, the more you can pick up on a given stop, the longer the jump can be till you get to the next set of letters that you, that you need to take in. Um, so in essence, when we read normally, we are picking up about three to four letters to the left of our fixation point and about six to ten letters to the right because you and I, as, as uh, readers of English, read from top to bottom and left to right. Left to right is what I'm particularly concerned with there. Uh, but for Hebrew, uh, a right to left um, uh, kind of language in, in print, it's the reverse. That is, you're leading in the direction that your eyes are moving in order to pick up the, um, the print. So you lead into the future with your, when you're picking up information from your, from your eyes as you're reading. Um, typical reading would be about 300 words per minute. Um, newscasters can belt it out at least 300 words per minute, in some cases faster if they're in the middle of emergency and trying to get a lot of words in. Um, Mattress Mac in his commercials jams. I want to go back and count one of his commercials sometime because I am sure that he's putting out more than 500, 300 words a minute. My bet would be closer to 500. Um, and you'll notice that the understanding or the pronunciation deteriorates a little bit, particularly when he gets right at the end of talking about really will sell you money and so forth. I mean, you and I know what he's saying, but he's relying on the fact that we've heard it before because if you actually parsed out the individual sounds that he's giving you, it's minimal as to whether you could actually understand a, a, a new visitor to Houston might have trouble understanding the closing words on, on any of his commercials, as skilled as they are. Um, 
When it comes time to, to recognize words, we get into another kind of model, and that has to do with uh, the idea of dual encoding. That is that we find a word's meaning in one of two ways. With familiar words, uh, common words uh, we get directly from the printed sign. I mean, you understand them. You don't have to look up the word T-H-E every time you encounter it. You just you fold that into the meaning of whatever noun is going to follow it, and, and it simply is built into the word itself. Uh, familiar words, uh, common words, uh, also come directly from the printed sign. If your name appears, you don't have to process what's the meaning of it. the same way that if your, your second cousin twice removed's name showed up there, then you might have to spend a little more time contemplating why is that name in that particular position in the, in the sentence. But um, for, the, for the case of common words, the, the, um, the uh, conjunctions that we use, those are looked up essentially instantly, as are the familiar words. Um, on the other hand, if we've got the unfamiliar or the more complex words, um, then what tends to happen is that as we're reading, particularly if we're reading a complex uh, work, what we do is to translate from the ink on the page to a sound code we will tend to pronounce to ourselves when we're reading uh, and then locate the meaning within our head because the, the meanings are, of course, stored um, in sound. That is, the words, I should say, are stored in sound. And it suggests that basically we pronounce unfamiliar words to ourselves as we're in the process of seeking the particular meaning of, the, of those um, units. That means that another thing that also plays a role in, in expanding or understanding a given word is context. It's a very helpful context, uh, or it's, uh, the cues offered by context are very helpful. Give you an example. Sternberg and Powell in 1983 came out with the, the following su suggestion, uh, following demonstration. The sentence they wrote was, at dawn, the blend arose on the horizon and shone brightly. Blen, obviously, in that case, is, is the sun talked about at dawn and so forth. Uh, but in that case, the context itself, the rest of the sentence, is what allowed you to infer that blen could be, would be substituted for the word sun in that particular situation. More context cues, greater rapidity in retrieving the, the meaning of any particular word. And that leads us then into another process that's also ongoing as, as we're recognizing words as we read, and that is essentially metacomprehension. In other cases, it will be called metacognition. But in essence, in metacognition comprehension, what we're talking about is that if you um, paused over the, the Sternberg-Powell example that I gave you, what you're engaged in there is essentially metacomprehension, which is basically thoughts about reading comprehension. If you actually concentrate on um, the, the meaning of the written word, it's Self. You're engaged in, in uh, metacomprehension in that case. Most college students now um, are not very good with their metacomprehensive skills. That's one thing that has suffered in, in recent years. We have so many other fancy things to keep you busy with. Uh, but if you read passages holding your head, uh, nodding your head that you understand them, and then take an exam which you flunk, a multiple choice exam which you don't do well on, it suggests then that, that um, what you need to do is reread the passage to really pull out the meaning that is involved in that particular case. It is a good idea when you're doing any material to take a pretest. When you've read it, take a pretest. That's actually the reason why many books, many, many introductory texts, have a study guide either written to, to correlate with them, or in fact, in some cases, you'll have review questions in the back of a chapter that you can go over the content, the detail, the substantive meaning of, uh, of, the, um, of the questions you've just read. In some ways, that's a good way to, to review the material to make sure that you've got it, because uh, summary questions essentially represent the author's listing of, of what he or she or they think are the most important things they've told you. So in some ways, you can read those final questions as a hint as to what you ought to pay attention to, pay particular attention to, in reading the particular chapter that's involved in a given situation. Um, we also then, beyond intaking language, we're also faced with the idea of, um, um, of, of producing languages. And, and in that case, we've got a number of different um, factors that are necessary in order for us to be able to produce language. It's predicated, for instance, on, first of all, having sufficient brain resources to be able to do that. We are by far the most sophisticated um, um, member of the animal kingdom, uh, and it's the size of our forebrain that has allowed the storage space for the tens of thousands of words and all the nuances associated with it that we actually have, and, and that is, uh, that's one of the enablers of, of our very sophisticated language. When we, when we have communicated to other, other animals, um, 
elephants are one good example of, of uh, species that does tend to communicate with one another uh, with various kind of trumpetings and so forth and so on. But it's a relatively unsophisticated language because of the size of the brain that's involved. Chimps are kind of halfway between. They have a larger uh, language. And, and Washoe, for instance, the last time I checked, had a, if I remember correctly, had a word vocabulary, a, a separate unit that she could sign somewhere between 200 and 500 individually recognizable signs that she could make with her uh, hands in communicating with uh, her owners or anybody else for that matter. Um, a second thing that we need is, is the, um, well, the brain storage I've just talked about. Uh, we need a speech mechanism tightly stretched uh, cords uh, going across the air box. Um, those are things that allow us to differentiate between these kind of sounds. If you think about it, the vowels, A, E, I, O, and U, all involve shaping the mouth, but all of them are open. All of the sounds are produced strictly by the shape of the mouth itself. The air is not blocked at all. It's simply A, E, and so forth. It's, it's shaping where your tongue is, where your, your cheeks are pulled in, and, and so forth. All of which give you the, the necessary sounds to be able to, the phonemes to produce uh, vowels. Consonants, on the other hand, do various kinds of restrictions on the, the airflow. The labial sounds using the, the lips involve F and V. The plosive sounds where we block the air just momentarily involve these letters. The nasal sounds involve the resonance in the, in the nasal cavity for m and n. And finally, voiced versus non-voiced. F and V are one example of that. S and Z are another example where the mouth is shaped precisely the same to produce both sounds. But in one case, you wiggle your vocal cords, and in the other case, you don't. And the net result is you're producing the difference between s and z. And that is enough difference to make a, to make a unique phoneme uh, in building the language that we're talking about here. If we look at the, the language itself, there are a number of different, uh, oh, and the fourth element that I also wanted to talk about is the fact that we also have to have the ability to, uh, to engage in, in abstract reasoning um, in, in using the abstraction of language, which is strictly an abstraction from whatever it is that we're communicating about. And then finally, uh, there's an argument about this, but it seems pretty clear that the, our physiological development has enabled language in, in us humans. And so in one case, we might talk about the inherited inclination toward utilizing language. We have the ability to do it. We have all the equipment necessary. And in fact, we do seem to do it. So there may be an inherited inclination um, to engage in, in language. A number of different common features exist uh, with language. Uh, there are four that, that all languages share in common and the terms that are utilized in those languages. One is exclusivity. That is, any given sound sequence has a particular um, um, uniqueness to it. And that's defined also in another way in that the linkage is arbitrary. And that is, the linkage between the symbol and its referent, whatever it identifies, is strictly arbitrary. But it's, it's consistent across people. The link is exclusive and unique to that individual term. So if I say to you something like arm, you know immediately what I'm talking about as a body part or the, the nature of the chair, what part of the chair you're sitting in that I'm using right now. Both of those are, are the benefits of the exclusivity and arbitrariness of the linkage between sounds and the, the concepts to which they um, refer. A third, and I would argue probably the most unique and critical portion of, of the features, that, that the abilities that we have and that, that language offers us is productivity. And that is essentially our vocabulary. When you entered the University of Houston, you probably had a vocabulary in the neighborhood of 50,000 fundamental words and the nuances related to when it's a noun, when it's a verb, and so forth. But about 50,000 words. And that vocabulary, if you're kind of a standard student in process, will roughly double one more time. A lot of the vocabulary that you learn here will tend to be specialized. It'll be jargon in your own major, whatever you choose to do. But the size of your vocabulary will go up because you're talking to other smart people. You get to practice your vocabulary a lot in writing papers for faculty members and, and so forth and so on. But in essence, I'm going to argue that perhaps the key feature in, in the four that I'm listing here is productivity. And that is the fact that we take those 50,000 words as, as a high school graduate and combine them in essentially an infinite number of ways. One of the elements being that if a, a particular adjective, uh, sorry, if a particular noun doesn't really convey what you're trying to say, you know, when it snows out, somebody asks you, what's, what's the snow like? Well, it's white, but that doesn't really capture if you're going to be driving what you need to know. If it's fluffy, it's blowing. Um, if it's moist, it's on the ground, uh, and it may get soggy and, and not blow away when you drive across it and so forth. So there are a number of different things, and the way we handle that is add adjectives. 
what adjectives do is simply add nuance to the nature of the meaning of the base word that it's attached to, whatever that happens to be. But we use that um, essentially for pr the productivity of language. It allows us to use a finite vocabulary to produce essentially infinite number of meanings. Now, mathematically, that's not precisely correct. But essentially, with a vocabulary of 100,000 words, you can communicate a lot of, I mean, you can communicate all of the Bible or, or the longest bestseller that's now available or anything like that. Same language, uh, just strung together in, in different kinds of ways. That has to do with productivity. Uh, and I would argue that of all the features of language, that is perhaps the most challenging one, the most opening one for us. And then finally, it also exhibits what is called duality of patterning. That is, what the language does is essentially replicate the world about which it is communicating. And in the example I was using a minute ago, adding adjectives to a noun, what you're doing is simply adding nuances to tree. Well, it's an oak tree, uh, it's a rotten tree, it's a dried tree, it's a brown tree, it's green, it's in bloom. I mean, you can use words to, to create a lot of different images of the particular tree that we happen to be talking about there. Um, all of that is basically founded upon the, the duality of, of patterning, the fact that the language itself can be made to parallel anything out in the real world, or the abstract world for that matter, that we want to talk about. Now, planning to speak is, is another skill that we have to develop here in order to, to uh, produce language. We have a thought, we arrange it into its constituent elements, the tongue, the lips, and the vocal cords move appropriately, and the general, the general thought that we're trying to express is there. Uh, the selection of the verb in a sentence may actually await the beginning of the sentence itself. That is oftentimes when you and I are, are talking to one another, if I'm laying out a 50, 100 word sentence to you, the actual words that I will use slot by slot by slot, position by position in the sentence may not be known to me. Um, if, I were to, if you were to stop me mid-sentence, I may not be able to tell you what word I would have pulled in in that situation. Because when you and I are communicating, uh, one of the limits to how rapidly we can do it is how rapidly we can get into the brain and pull in the words that we need in a given situation. Um, and so that's, that's a, a, um, uh, the, the planning function once we start speaking. It isn't always the case when you start a sentence that you know how it's going to end or what the total impact of the message will be. It's kind of an inclination that you're uh, relaying to somebody. Um, and one of the problems we have, of course, is the linearization problem. You don't face it too often, but have you ever had a problem that you were trying to describe to somebody, or maybe an event, you saw an explosion in the sky, or something like that, and when you start trying to describe it to people, you're almost flustered, you're kind of, <laughs> because you've got so many different elements of, of that explosion that you saw that you really want to start with, the brightness of it, the distance of it, uh, how rapidly it blew up, what colors you saw, all of those different things are relevant, and in essence, since we have the kind of language we do, it is linear in function. It, it progresses word to word to word. And so you ultimately have to make a, a mental decision, a cognitive decision, on which word you're going to use and which one you're going to follow it with and so forth. And that essentially is, is the linearization problem. Uh, deciding which word order to use and it's an active ongoing process the entire time that you're talking. Which in turn leads into a, another rather interesting series of, of effects that we can look at, and those include the various kinds of screw-ups that we make, errors that will occur when we're talking. Um, uh, and they, they uh, well, you just heard me do one a minute ago uh, when I was in the, the middle of, of uh, pausing to see where I was going next in the uh, notes. Uh, is an example of a filled pause. Okay, it's, it's a matter of, uh, I'm indicating to you when I, when I say uh, that I'm not done speaking, that I'm, I'm searching for which concept I want to put next or what order, I, what word I want to use or something like that. But that's one of the examples of, of a speech error that in some cases can occur. Uh, filled pauses, uh, a second one are slips of the tongue, um, which are fascinating. I mean, there are whole books that have been written on why words tend to get swapped. Uh, with one another in, in a given situation. Um, in some cases, you'll have two words in a given sentence, um, and what'll happen is the, the basic pronunciation, the stress in a given word is the same, but you've got the wrong word in the position. So you'll, you'll switch the words, but leave the pronunciations where they're supposed to be in terms of the, the stress pattern and things like that. There are a lot of different ways in which uh, slips of the tongue can occur. And that comes back partly to the processing speech. You and I, when we're talking to one another at 300 words a minute, we have to do a pretty rapid scan, pulling in the word we want and insert it where we need it in the sentence. And that includes how we pronounce it. Uh, and sometimes if we're a little sloppy on that, we get a word that doesn't quite compute the way it should have. In most cases, when you have a letter inversion, 
it only occurs across about three or four words, which is a really good estimate of how far ahead of where we're talking at any given time our head is in actually pulling in the words that we're going to use in a given sentence. Okay? If you think about those kind of sound inversions, they don't tend to go from first word to last in a sentence. They tend to be only about three or four words ahead, a kind of a, a crude but effective measure of, of uh, how far ahead of ourselves we're processing at any given time. Um, and that's going to put us then into some of the, the other social exchange processes of, of uh, language itself. Um, one of the elements of that that, that uh, I wanted to drop in here, I guess I skinned past the other one I wanted to talk about, and that was the, the lack of background knowledge. But if you listen to anyone talking to someone who is markedly younger, there is evidence to say, I think I've talked about this once before, but even a five-year-old will adjust his or her language down to make it simpler when talking to a three-year-old. So in general, whoever is the more sophisticated linguist tends to lower their language to the level of the person uh, to whom they're talking, unless they're really trying to blow them out. If you're trying to punish a, uh, a child or something, in that case, you may talk at full adult level so you can render your full fury on them in a given situation. But when communication is the effect that you're after, then you're going to tend to adjust to the language level of the person to whom you're talking because it's crucial to garner their um, understanding in, in a uh, given situation. So one of the things we're looking at then is pragmatics, which is essentially the use of language to communicate and to accomplish social goals. Um, I had a, f a friend of mine in, in graduate school was walking down the street one day kind of anticipating um, he had just proposed to his uh, now wife uh, at that time and was quite happy about the, the situation he found himself in. So he was kind of uh, walking down the street whistling, first of all, humming or whistling to himself at the same time that he was talking. So in fact, I guess he was singing at various times. So he was walking down the street humming, whistling, and, and talking to himself um, about the things that were going on in his life at that point. And he looked over at one point, and there was somebody sitting in a car about 10 feet away by the curb looking at him very strangely as he walked past. So talking to ourselves is something that all of us may do in a given situation. We just don't tend to do it when other people are around. Um, it tends to be a social concept and we don't tend to talk to ourselves. We're all guilty of doing it at various times. You find, can't find a knife in the kitchen drawer and if you're alone you're standing there talking to the knives. Where are you? I know it's in here. And so forth. Um, so we use the, the verbiage all the time. Um, a lot of different things are communicated by any of the of the messages that we give. For instance, if I said to you something like, "I went to the co went to a concert last night, and the people behind us talked all night," that's telling you several things. First of all, it's based on our concept of what kind of a concert it must have been, because in a rock concert, talking might be acceptable, but in a symphony concert, it would not be. Uh, opera, same kind of way. Um, and then also the fact that I said the people behind us, there was more than one in a conversation. Uh, it wasn't just somebody mumbling about the opera uh, or the, the symphony, whatever. Um, and in addition, when I said the word behind, or the phrase behind us, it immediately implied that I was with somebody else in the conversation. So there's a lot of stuff that is, is simply a part of the unwritten language. It's just the system that you and I agree on. Certain rules imply certain things in a given situation. And that greatly enriches um, our ability to communicate with each other. But those schemas, which is what they're called, essentially represent shared knowledge. You know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about going to a concert. The idea that I said somebody talked all night implies that talking was not appropriate in that situation. So there's just a whole package of things that go along with being able to understand specifically what I'm telling you in that kind of a, uh, of a statement. Um, when you get engaged in, in uh, conversation, there are a lot of different things that are going on um, as we, as we uh, share information with each other, one of which has to do with the fact that you and I share background knowledge. There has to be a certain amount. I mean, you have to understand what a concert involves, uh, people sitting in rows, uh, generally quiet, depending on the nature of, of the particular music that's involved, and so forth. But that's part of the background knowledge on which our schemas for concerts, movies, and so forth and so on are, are based. Um, and our language uh, depends on it. Um, the language itself significantly involves a give and take, an exchange. For instance, if you get a kind of a look when I'm talking to you, that's telling me that you don't really understand what I'm saying. I mean, that's, that's a nonverbal way, and we'll talk about that more later, but it's, that's one way in which you and I are constantly giving and taking to each other in terms of, as I'm talking, you can't talk. That's just part of the rules of, of the cooperative nature of, of talking. But you can still scowl to indicate uh, 
you disagree, you don't understand a variety of things, you may be grinning simply because you agree or you understand what I'm talking about. That kind of a thing. Maybe if we're talking about uh, the behavior of someone else in a given situation, you may nod this kind of way with a grin on your face and you're essentially saying to the speaker in that situation, um, I understand what you're saying. Um, and that's part of the, the give and take that is involved in, in linguistic uh, communication. Um, Clark and Wilkes Gibbs uh, produced a rather interesting experiment in which they, they created uh, 12 abstract figures. They're, they're kind of like uh, the way cartoonists sometimes illustrate spilled ink. They were that kind of irregular kind of shape. In this case, it was done by point-to-point -point drawings, random dots where the outer edge was simply uh, connected by a straight line. So you got a kind of an unpredictable series of, of abstract figures. What was involved there was to have two people with the shapes in front of them, but a barrier between them. So one person had to arbitrarily put the shapes uh, of significant difference in, in shape in, a, in a, two rows, two rows of six shapes each. And then what they had to do was to communicate to the other person the order. So that what the, the task of the second person was to take just the verbal cues and understand um, how the, in other words, try to replicate the row on the other side of the barrier when they simply could not see it. Verbal communication, anything was, in, was fair but they couldn't, uh, they couldn't actually share. I mean, normally we just hold it up, okay, this one is number one, and so forth. Couldn't do that, you had to describe it. Okay, the one that has the single longest uh, departure from center point is, is going to be in number one. Uh, it has a total of one, two, three, four, five, eight outer points, or three in the bottom left, in a variety of different ways. So in any case, it turns out that in order to get that first figure correct, um, that, sorry, the total number of, of communications in, in, the, um, in getting the, the figures lined up um, is essentially almost four uh, when you're getting that first figure lined up. And as you look at each progressive figure, um, what quickly develops is an agreement as to what kind of a vocabulary is actually going to be used. So that by the time you get to the sixth item among the 12, um, the need for verbal communication has dropped way down. You've, you've uh, just identified some way of doing it, the number of points, uh, the number of extended points uh, or um, sharp extrusions from the figure, any, any of a variety of different ways. But the interesting thing is that if someone else has watched the development of that language, even though they've watched the two of you and what shapes you're working with and the orders in which you're putting them uh, together, it is not possible for that person simply to step in and sit down in the second person's place and assume the vocabulary. It is really something that the two people have to participate in the development of. So language participants really have to participate in the development of the language that they're going to use in order to communicate with each other about what, what element belongs in, in which particular uh, position. There are some other rules always involved in that kind of linguistic exchange that are relevant here. One of them is the fact that the speakers, by definition, take turns. Okay, I talk for a while, uh, describe which shape I want you to move, you then ask a question. Is it the one that has the, you know, and then you give me a verbal description of the one you think I'm talking about. Uh, two people do not talk at once in any given communication situation, unless you're in an argument. In that case, when you're trying to make a particular point, the other person who may disagree with you even strongly um, will at some point cut you off and start talking because they understand what you're going to pursue, they don't happen to agree with you, and they want to get their point out and justify it. Long pauses are not legal. If I pass you on the street, that's a particularly interesting timing sequence that goes on when two people simply pass in the street. Because in fact, as you're walking past somebody, you do not look at them all the way past, okay? That just would be a no-no. It would be insulting. There's a point at which when you're passing somebody in the hallway, you look at them about five, six, eight feet out, you nod, or you say good morning, or whatever you're going to say by way of a social uh, exchange. Notice when you do that, and I challenge you to try it in the hallways in, in, the, in the future mornings, notice that oftentimes whatever you say, that other person will say back to you. And that's partly driven by the fact that the sequence, the timing is really very precise in that kind of a mutual acknowledgement. Uh, it may just be a hi or it may be hi, how are you? If you know the person or know them well or like them or something like that. Um, but their ability to acknowledge since both of you are headed in opposite directions with different tasks, you've only got a fraction of a second in which to get your thing across and then get a response of one sort or another. But in fact, we don't tend to 
look past people, and that would be an act of aggression. If you look at somebody and don't acknowledge them and just keep watching them with the turning of the head as you walk past them, that at some point becomes aggressive. So there are a lot of different cues that are involved in, in the exchange of, of information. Telephone rules, by contrast, are different. Uh, in that case, the answerer, whoever answers the phone, will typically have a very quick uh, response. Uh, I got very annoyed years ago uh, when people would call my office having looked up my name and dial my phone. Uh, the first question they would ask is, is this Dr. Cashaw? And so nowadays I simply answer my phone at school with my first name. And so then every now and then if somebody isn't paying attention, I'll get the, is this Dr. Oh yes, hi and then go on. But the intent was simply to cut off the, the need for that initial exchange. I'll tell them who they're going to be, who they're talking to. And it often makes it easier to get directly into the uh, question. They can say, oh, hi, and go on, not expecting me to have to answer it. Um, the caller identifies themselves. When, when, when you answer the phone and, in, you know, hello or whoever you are, um, the next thing you expect is an identification as to who's calling and why in that kind of a situation. Uh, the answer acknowledges that identification usually very briefly. So the conversation is something like, cash off. Hi, I wanted to ask about when that first exam is, or hi, this is Bonnie calling. And the response will be something like, oh, or hi, something like that. So that one, two, three sequence is, is very precise if you watch your telephone calls. You identify yourself very briefly, the caller identifies him or herself very briefly, and in turn you acknowledge it, again very briefly. The whole sequence may not take two seconds, start to finish, but it's a ritual that we always go through in a telephone call, always in that way. When you and I pass in, in the uh, hallway, we don't have to identify, I'm an instructor, you're a student, uh, you're enrolled in this class, and, that, and so forth. That doesn't happen, but it does with telephones, partly because we can't see each other. So the rules change in that kind of a, um, a situation. But the caller continues, after that three-part experience, change, then the purpose of the call is actually uh, the basis for the rest of the conversation there. Um, when you finish the conversation, the wind down is, is gradual. Uh, there may be several alterations that that kind of a termination sequence can go through. Uh, it often includes, for instance, plans for the next conversation. As in, okay, after I get the information, I'll call you mid-afternoon or something like that. Okay, that is part of the, the ritual of ending a telephone conversation. Another element on which all of this is based um, is simply politeness. We tend to be polite to one another. We're not often savage in a telephone call. It can happen, but not particularly often. What's the effect of being a polite in our conversation? Among other things, our sentences tend to get longer. They tend to get more complex. They also tend to get more indirect. Um, the role of politeness is basically to acknowledge the other person's uh, feelings in, in, a, in the exchange of, of information that's going on. So all in all then, we can, we can kind of wrap this up as a, as a summary of verbal communication with the idea of, of, um, of making it effective. So the communication, as we defined it earlier, is essentially an exchange of messages, either by verbal or by nonverbal means. And the nonverbal means are, are amazingly flexible in various situations. But the modes of communication are normally face-to-face, person-to-person, face-to-face, person-to-intermediary, which can also happen. If you're entering a country whose language you don't speak, in that case you may interact with you as the person with the passport interact with a translator who in fact conveys your information to the, um, the uh, whatever the officer is who's letting you into the country. That's an example of where you would interact directly with the intermediary, although the purpose of the conversation is to the other person on, at the table there. Um, we can communicate by letters, by faxes, uh, we can exchange video or audio tapes. There are a lot of different ways in which we can, uh, in which we can, can communicate with each other. Um, some include both verbal and nonverbal communication. Others are, are verbal only in a, in a given situation. But the key element is, is basically an exchange of information or messages between one or another. The, the messages can be statements, facts, opinions, thoughts, questions, beliefs, orders, riddles, prophecies, threats. It goes on and on and on anything the producer wishes, wishes to, uh, to generate in a given situation. It is fair game uh, for that kind of a, an exchange of, of uh, information. Um, effective communication has a number of different elements to it that we might look at, one of which includes the, the various barriers, and that is um, effective communication exists when the message basically, um, when, when a message source wishes to send um, 
a message which is received and interpreted accurately. That would define essentially effective communication. One of the hindrances to that is the idea of the existence of various kind of barriers that may exist in a given situation. There can be physical barriers. Um, have you ever had one of your molars removed? Um, many in the viewing audience are at an age when that is likely to happen. And that is a very painful process. I, I remember when I had it done, I had all four removed at the same time. Um, based on some people's advice. And I guess in retrospect, it was the correct way to do it. If you're gonna be agonizingly mouth-pained, you might as well do it all at once and get it over with in, in one slug of, of tranquilizers. Uh, but in any case, it really fouls up your ability to communicate for a while because you have to be very careful about creating any pressure on, on the um, surface of blood that is surfacing, is, is forming where the tooth has just been pulled out of your mouth. Have you ever had a severe case of laryngitis? That's another example of a physical barrier that will really frustrate somebody's ability to uh, to communicate. Those are various kinds of physical impediments to communication which can clearly happen. Everything from, um, it would also include things like developmental disabilities or, or uh, injury, uh, either by accidents or by drugs or by senescence um, to the brain. Uh, physical impediments that affect the mouth, the ears, or the eyes can lead to impeding uh, communication in, in one way or another. There are also various kinds of problems that the receiver can, can uh, experience in, in a given situation. Here, what we're, we're looking at is, is um, um, hearing problems. Uh, somebody who has difficulty hearing. Uh, if you've ever talked to a really old person whose hearing is, is deteriorating, you may sometimes hear him or her say, um, what did you say or I didn't really hear you. Um, and in that case, they're simply pleading um, either for, for your need to speak up because there's noise in the environment, or in some cases, their hearing is in the process of failing. But in any case, the net result is it impedes uh, uh, communication. Uh, they have to spend more concentrated effort listening to somebody uh, and then confessing when they're not able to detect what the message happens to be. There can also be various, those are, those are physical hindrances. There are also various kinds of psychological obstacles that, that can, um, that can crop up to, to impede communication in one way or another. This one is tricky, uh, but it's really crucial to successful uh, communication. As one example, I can't easily model it here in the studio, but have you ever had somebody, a salesman for instance, who tends to get very close to you? I mean, if the normal distance is 12 or 15 inches, minimum 15 inches, particularly with somebody you don't know, and they get in your face. I mean, in your face is, is a phrase we sometimes use to describe a particular exchange between two people. He was really in my face. Well, that means essentially they were standing too close. And of course, the effect is when it's a high pressure salesman, the solution is that you start backing up. You back away from them and they step forward and you back up further. And at some point, you're either going to have to put your hand out and stop them at some appropriate distance or, or do something like that. But that's part of a, a psychological obstacle that, that is there and, and a hindrance to good communication. Or on the other hand, you may have people that stand you know, six or eight feet away. If you think about walking down a hallway here at the University of Houston having a conversation with somebody, it's never more than about a foot to 18 inches that is separating you. Uh, there's about an arm with, uh, a hand width, hand span between, you know, that's the, the edge of you, if this is you, there's about a nine inch window around you that people don't tend to violate. And if you add another nine inches for the other person you're walking with, you're gonna be roughly 18 inches apart as you're walking down the hallway together. Um, and what that does is facilitate good communication, but it also means that you can speak in a rather casual voice when you're talking to somebody. But when I'm talking to somebody in this room who is 30 or 35 feet away, I don't tend to use the kind of casual conversation voice that I use when I'm talking to somebody whose face is 18 inches away from me. So we do adjust uh, loudness to distance in, in that particular situation. Um, and the, the, um, the being too far away is just as, as bad. Uh, that is someone who stands too far away can frustrate the, 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 the that is, is, is creating another kind of psychological obstacle to the exchange, of, a fruitful exchange of information in that particular situation. Um, disinterest may result from other things that either talker or communicator may have, and that is, for instance, a lack of trust. 
um, you're just not particularly interested in what somebody's saying because you simply do not trust them. Um, a lack of liking an individual. You don't care to solicit information or gain information from somebody whom you have, on whatever basis, previously decided I don't like him or her, whatever it happens to be. Um, a, lack of, a lack of desire to be uh, influenced by that. If you, t if you think about your political preferences, you're probably not willing to be cornered at a cocktail party very long, talked to by somebody of the opposite party. You know, you've, you've analyzed the issues they're likely to raise when they start into the party line, uh, and you've already made a decision. I, I don't agree with that. Uh, and so you don't want to stand there rebattling the decisions you've already made at some time, rediscussing in some way. Um, another is, is the failure to find uh, the other person a credible, a credible source in a given situation. If you just don't think they have anything to offer, that can be another reason why you essentially distance yourself from them and terminate the conversation fairly rapidly. All of those are essentially psychological obstacles to, to effective communication. Um, on the other hand, uh, there are other kinds of obstacles built into that. If you're in love with somebody, it can be very difficult to tell them something that they need to know about their own personality. Maybe they've got very bad breath in a given day, and it really should be known that, that you, know, you, want it, you feel an obligation to tell them simply because you love them, uh, and it's important to you that, that the rest of the world uh, also appreciate that person. And so you're very likely to, it may be awkward, but you'll probably find a way to, to indicate, uh, I just thought you ought to know that, uh, you know, and then you'll mention the fact that uh, the breath stings today, or, or they must have had garlic last night, or some way to, to raise the issue with them, simply so that they'll be sensitive to it and maybe not stand quite in the face of, of the other people that they're, that they're talking to. Um, another factor that's psychological can impact communication is the fact that you're afraid of that other individual. Fear itself will, will hinder uh, or impede the amount of, of communication that can go on between people. Um, fears of rejection or isolation uh, or financial constraints can be also things that impede um, uh, communication among people. Uh, you're not as likely to be free and open with information about yourself and your family and so forth if you're talking to a bank official trying to seek a new loan or something like that. Uh, you're very guarded and, and uh, protected, not lying, you're just, you're careful in the way in which you present various kinds of information. Um, and in a, in, a, uh, in a Vita, one of the classic examples of outward one-way communication is a Vita where you kind of list all the things that you've accomplished. What you tend to do in that situation is stress the things that you've done well because a Vita is, is that's the only effort that you can make to sell yourself in a given situation. So you want to start with the strengths. You want to list on that Vita the things that you've done that are most impressive relative to somebody you're trying to impact in that. That's all part of the, the psychological aspects uh, that can be frustrated by various kinds of obstacles. The, the um, bad organization of a Vita can be one thing that fails to communicate your, your true value to a particular organization and so forth. Um, even a careless word can terminate a conversation in some conversations, terminate a, a communication that you really didn't mean to stop uh, in that way. Um, there are also another set of things involved, and that would be things like cultural barriers. Uh, if you think about it, 7-Eleven markets, the, the kind of 24-hour quick market, uh, tends to be run often by Asian Americans. Um, and, and, and it's simply a role description. I'm not, I'm not abusing people at all in this, in this description, but you'll recognize what I'm saying, and that is that, for instance, in, in Korea, um, one of the social factors in, in the training you know, that families engage in for, for kids and so forth is, is you don't tend to, well, that's true also in the US, don't speak to strangers. Uh, and you combine that with a, a Korean uh, inclination not to be too familiar in business. One of the kind of ground rules of, of uh, bonding worker to, to boss or, or uh, uh, one company's representative to another company's representative is don't get too familiar. Keep it on a strictly uh, need to know person to person basis uh, relative to the company itself. But you don't tend to become too familiar. The difficulty, of course, is that somebody newly uh, arrived from, from uh, Korea walks in with these, these home trainings, which are, are central to success in, in Korea. Um, and they don't work so well here. Because somebody who is, it tends not to want to start a conversation and to be fairly distant when they interact with you is going to create the impression from American standards um, that they're, they're distant or remote somehow. They, they're just not interested in you. At the worst, it's as if they're ungrateful for your business, simply because and the only thing that's causing that stress is, is cultural differences. So you need to kind of take the time to, to uh, learn some of the surround as to why a particular person might be kind of standoffish to you if they're of a different culture. Um, in dating, 
uh, relationships uh, as will happen here on campus uh, and is increasing in the city as a whole simply because the number of Hispanics is steadily growing. That's the largest single growth area among the population in, in Houston. Um, and if you date um, cross-orientation, that is Anglo versus Hispanic, um, if the relationship falls apart, one of the things that whites are not typically aware of is the fact that traditionally Hispanics are, are taught to shun people with whom they're no longer in love so it's not to imply any less love for the person that they ultimately marry. And so the, the idea that you stand off as, as a, a Hispanic no longer in love with somebody is not targeted directly at that person, but it's really a more social kind of, of representation that, that um, you're, in a, you're in a situation where you really do need to back off and, and for, the, for the sake of, of the social relation with whoever you do end up uh, marrying, um, they need to understand that, that from the perspective of your culture, you have done the proper thing. You've distanced that person definitively uh, in a given situation. Um, cultural differences need to be communicated in this kind of a situation. My ex-wife is, uh, is Indian and we've had a number of different valuable exchanges over the years about what happens in particular kinds of interactions either between Indians, uh, between an Indian and a, um, an Anglo, um, or between Anglos in the presence of Indians or Indians in the presence of Anglos. And, and um, uh, among other things, for instance, Indian culture is strongly patriarchal which is not true in, in, uh, in this country. If, if anything, we are kind of equally oriented, expecting both man and woman to contribute more or less equally to a marriage. Um, and it was interesting that, that uh, it took my wife and I several years uh, to work out the ground rules while we were married. Uh, Ex-wife is what I should say. Uh, it took us a couple of years to work out the ground rules, basically about who was gonna make decisions uh, regarding finance and so forth and so on, because being of, of Western uh, influence and orientation, I was very much about this, this is our money, let's decide what we're gonna do with it. She was very much about um, the patriarchal orientation of, of the Indian community. And it took a while to, to really encourage her into participating in various kinds of financial decisions. What kind of car are we going to get? You know, the kind of thing that goes into any marital relationship. Um, so those cross-cultural barriers, not barriers, but, but um, uh, walls need to be scaled and, and it's done best by simply communicating. Talk about them if you have a problem. Um, there are also various kinds of situational hindrances. Um, when you graduated from high school, did you leave a boyfriend or a girlfriend behind? The idea is, you know, well, we'll always be in love, and I'll come to, you know, wherever you go to school, I'll make sure I get there, and so forth. It's good in theory, it doesn't tend to work in practice. Uh, it simply doesn't work. Distance is one of the most effective ways to kill any relationship. Um, marital couples where the husband is on the road a lot can, can appreciate that fully because he is simply not at home. And, even, and for that matter, uh, where the female uh, is, the, the wife is doing the traveling. It's, it's just stressful on a marriage when you have a house husband and the wife is always on the road. Um, there are a lot of different uh, strategies that have been developed. One of the more effective ways to, to summarize that is a book by Eric Byrne, published back in 1964, that is really kind of timeless. It's called Games People Play, uh, and it's as on target today as it was when it was published over 45 years ago now. Read it and you can learn the various lessons of, of what is called transactional analysis, which is a style of interaction among people and the modification of such styles. But it has some, some valuable information in there about how people interact or fail to in a given uh, situation. So then let's look at, uh, in terms of verbal communication, how we're going to achieve it effectively. Uh, and one of the things I want to recommend for you is that you participate in what is called active listening. And by that, what I mean is that you apply undivided attention to whatever it is that you're trying to, um, to which you're trying to attend, including things like anticipation and or visualization. So what I mean then by anticipation is essentially that you track the speaker enough uh, to understand what he or she is actually saying. Um, a good test is to try, for instance, to guess the next point that's going to be made. If you're really in an exchange of information with somebody, you ought to be able to understand and guess what the next point is going to be. If not, it becomes a good opening for you to raise yet another issue in a given uh, situation. Another thing you might want to participate in is visualization uh, when you're listening to a conversation. Um, one of the, um, on NPR, I, I listen to, a, I'm a fan of, of a number of the shows that are on Saturday morning, one of which is uh, Car Talk, which is kind of everybody's favorite. But the next one is Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, which was actually here in, in town uh, earlier this year. Um, but it's interesting that the way the, the show, that show starts, um, 
involves a, I'd see either that one or the next one, but the point I was going to make is that one of the shows on on Saturday morning has two teams that are competing with each other, and the announcer who sets it up each week identifies Team A, which will be led by Lawrence so-and-so or Juanita such-and-such, -such, um, is sitting on, will be sitting on stage left. And all that does is really just provide a context around which you can visualize what's actually going on so that when you're listening to and trying to appreciate which team is arguing what kind of perspective, the, the announcer does a very good job of, of essentially anchoring everybody in terms of the visualization that you can do. Um, if you've ever had the experience of listening to a ball game, for instance, and you get wrapped up in it to the extent that you're really understanding which of the two um, basketball uh, uh, nets is, is involved in the, in the exchange backboards, that's the word I'm looking for, which of the two backboards is involved, uh, if you've been in Hoffheinz enough, you know what the, what the relative difference is, uh, where one of them has an exit tunnel to the athletic locker rooms and everything else. Uh, and if they've anchored, if, if the announcer has anchored you in that way, you can, you can know which team is defending which goal, and it enriches your ability to understand what's going on when somebody cuts left. Well, if it's one team, they're headed one way, and if it's the other team, they're headed in, in another way. But that's an example of, of uh, visualization. Some other things that are involved in, in active um, listening would include things like um, empathy. If you've ever cried at a movie, that's an example of empathy. You've identified with the characters and the plot that's being presented enough so that, so that uh, you're essentially totally immersed in, in what's, uh, what's being said, that you actually will share some of the speaker's feelings, even emotions, in a given situation. Uh, that is, that's empathy. Um, another several things to involve yourself in, in active uh, listening or talking um, are, are paraphrasing. One really effective technique for, for involving you in, in, uh, in, in what's being exchanged with you is, is to restate somebody. Um, you can interrupt at a given point and, and say essentially, in other words, what you're saying is, and then essentially restate your understanding of whatever the speaker is, is saying. That's a very effective way to make sure both of you are on the same page, because if you haven't said it just right, that person is going to say, no, no, what I really meant was, and then they'll amplify whatever word or, or inference out of you, the description you've given isn't quite what was intended. So restatement or paraphrasing is a good way to make sure that you do understand what's being said to you. Um, another thing to do is to reinforce your partner. When you're in, a, in an exchange, um, you don't, even when you don't agree, reinforcement is still possible. Uh, so that you can interrupt a conversation occasionally with a phrase like, even if I don't, even if I don't always agree with you, I care about you and I, and I appreciate your opening up to me in this way or about this subject. I mean, that would be one way of saying somebody, somebody essentially, I don't agree with you, but I appreciate you as an individual. I, I know where you're coming from in that kind of a situation. You can even go so far, if you want to really get into this, as to use unconditioned positive regard. Remember the empathy established in client-centered therapy? That's exactly what I'm talking about. Try something like, uh, depending on who you're talking to, I love you very much, but it annoys me when you, and then you can mention whatever it is that's got you particularly annoyed at that particular time. And in that case, you're, you're engaging in unconditional positive regard. You start with a compliment or an, an outward release of, of the emotion you feel for somebody, and then what's causing you difficulty at that moment. We can also learn to ask questions to draw out information. If, if, if uh, you can either ask point blank questions, yes or no kind of things, or in other cases, it's, it's better to ask essentially a, a uh, what do you think about and describe the situation where you're trying to get more information. If it's open-ended, um, you really give the, the responder a lot more uh, latitude in, in how they shape the response to the question that you've asked there. You can also use things like self-disclosure. This is an excellent vehicle for, for getting people to open up to you. It, it conveys your own message, and yet it also uh, invites reciprocity. Uh, you're essentially reviewing um, if, if there are, uh, let me back up a little bit. What I was trying to say is there is an extensive series of comments in, in your textbook about that, about the many different circumstances um, governing when self-disclosure is important, because in some cases it's inappropriate. You know, you, you'll occasionally hear people say to a speaker, that's too much information. You've really given them more information there, or more information than I needed. Um, you're, you've essentially, in that case, opened up more than you should have in a given situation. So it's a kind of a delicate balance, but, but uh, your text, white and Lloyd Dunn and Hammer have a, a very good section on, on that particular feature. Um, in addition, you can extend the ground rules. Give your, per, your partner permission to say something that might upset you. Um, 
I really need to understand how you feel about this, that, or the other assignment, or something like that, so that I can, if I need to, I can modify it for you in the future. That kind of a thing when you're dealing with, uh, well, as an instructor, when I'm dealing with a student who's got particular, is particularly upset about a, an assignment or something like that. I'm, uh, you know, essentially, I've given them permission to tell me what's wrong with it. Why, why is this causing a problem for you? Uh, and you know, oftentimes I'll learn something that I wasn't aware of by way of a campus activity or something that's going on that's going to be directly competing with an assignment that I've given. Um, and then, in fact, uh, what we're also going to do now is to go into another important element of, of conversation, and that is you have a mouth for a reason, and that is you need to speak your mind in a given situation. This does not mean that you harbor a grumble and then suddenly flatten everybody in sight by speaking your mind. I mean, you don't hold everything in, build up this tremendous source of annoyance and then lay them flat with all the reasons you're worried about it. Um, but it does mean that you, you essentially express, you, you look out for your own needs, okay? Protect your needs in, in any given exchange. If you have a need, express it. Make it part of the overall conversation. If it causes problems for your, for your listener, then maybe you need to, to talk it through assertively, but senseless. Sense sensitively, that's the word I'm looking for there. Um, so you do need, you need to get your own needs out into a conversation, but, but if, if it's something directly contrary to what the other person uh, wants or expects, then you need to be sensitive in how you raise it. Just say, you know, from my own perspective, this is kind of what I'd like to see happen, and here's why. Um, and so you look out for your own needs. Also, very important that you be specific, okay? It isn't particularly helpful to say to somebody, you're a lousy lover. That is nowhere near as helpful as, I wish we could spend more time rubbing one another's back as one potential positive suggestion for change in that very delicate kind of a, a situation. But simply to blow somebody off by saying, you're a lousy lover, uh, doesn't work. It's not the way to do it. Be specific in, in, and, and sensitive in, in terms of what you're trying to say. Another thing that is very beneficial is use active sentences. Use a sentence with I. Uh, because in, it, what happens here is that if, if we tend to cater too much to the limits that are imposed by courtesy, um, as we talked about it earlier, you spend too much time respecting the needs of someone else. Um, and when making a particularly specific request for a need that we may have in a given situation, we tend to be obsequious. Don't do that. Make your point directly when it's important to you. As its importance increases, the directness with which you express it should also uh, be increased. Kind of like with the be specific, avoid loaded words in, in a given situation. Don't use such words. Calling somebody a male chauvinist pig is simply not a good opener for a rational discussion of whatever needs to be talked about in a given situation. One of the all-time great pieces of advice I got on, on talking to someone was succinctness consistent with clarity is considered virtuous, uh, which is a lot of big words, but what it really says is say it directly and say it rapidly in a given situation. Focus on exactly what you want to say. Don't cloud it with a lot of side issues that really aren't relevant to the particular issue that you're discussing in a given situation. Though you may need to know all the details and, and know them in a given situation, it's very unlikely that somebody else is, is, um, is as involved in the issue that you're talking about and therefore they don't need to know all the details. In fact, they will get bored by them and lose contact with you in terms of what you're trying to say. Uh, the description of that from a distance would be something like can't see the forest for the trees. Somebody who gets all tied up in the details of something is somebody who can't see the forest for the trees. They've lost track of the overall mission of a given uh, group or conversation or whatever may happen to be involved there. Um, also know how to communicate, how to relay the points that you're trying to make in a given situation. Develop a style that works best for you in a given situation and it will take it will take time. It will take a lot of meetings over the years, but try styles, try different approaches. You'll find in general that confrontation simply doesn't work. But if you find yourself crosswise with everybody else in the meeting, uh, some degree of adaptation is really necessary. Nobody is going to be, is going to come out of a meeting 100% achieving everything they wanted. And, and so compromise is really part of the reason you're meeting with somebody to begin with. So, so um, um, know how to communicate your needs, but essentially at the same time anticipate your listeners' responses. As part of effective listening, what you need to do is think through what you're going to say and try to anticipate what the, li the listener's reaction to it is likely to be and couch how you say it in terms of that. Another thing that is important and, and very much missed by many people is to make your behavior consistent with what you're trying to say in a given situation. Be aware that how you present yourself physically 
reinforces how you present yourself verbally in any given exchange. And by all means, do not burn bridges. It may be very tempting if you've got a strong disagreement with somebody to tell them to take a hike or go to and so forth. What that does is to essentially compromise your ability to communicate with them at any time in the future, even though they may be valuable for many other things in, in your life. I found a really nice quote by Franklin P. Jones, who said, and I had to read this a couple of times to fully understand what he was saying, but his comment was, honest criticism is hard to take, particularly from a relative, a friend, an acquaintance, or a stranger. And if you think about it a minute, there is a lot of power in that, because really you don't even need the illustrations. What he's really saying is honest criticism is hard to take, and it is. Most of us can improve if, if we're willing to listen and interact with people to appreciate the information they're trying to give us. And that puts us into one of my favorite areas after burning bridges, and that is nonverbal communication. And that it, what it's essentially arguing is that if, if someone sticks their tongue out at you, are you going to be upset in that situation? Well, in Tibet, someone just said to you was all they said to you was hello so where you are may make a difference as to the meaning of, of somebody sticking their tongue out at you and that's true of all nonverbal communication which is basically all human communications that don't involve words directly it is the case that in some cases what are involved there are overtly manifested words uh, whether spoken or written but um, I know that, that when I get us, and it happens every now and then, when you're dealing with a bunch of students, every now and then somebody is not going to be on the same page you are. You write a memo in perfect innocence and you get back one of these letters that has capped, uh, one of these emails that has capital letters in it. That's essentially writing loud, as, as I like to talk. But uh, uh, I actually got a, a almost a full paragraph in all caps recently. That was a bit of an achievement, a classic of, of miscommunication in that situation. But, but in essence, in both verbal and nonverbal speaking, we need to be careful of the nonverbal factors that, that we're oozing out uh, at any given time. Um, one way to look at that is to look at things like what kind of communication is achieved when you and I are talking to one another. There was one study that's been widely misquoted over the years that suggests that um, attitudes and, and feelings, 7% of it is, is communicated by the words that are actually used, the spoken words. 38% of it has to do with the speaker's tone of voice, and a whopping 55% has to do with the facial expressions that accompany it. That goes back a, about a third of a century to, uh, to some work by Morabian many, many years ago. That has been widely miscommunicated because what people have long since lost track of is the fact that what Morabian was, actually, Morabian was actually studying in that case and commenting on was emotional communication, specifically communication where emotion is part of it. So we would expect that a large proportion of it would not be communicated by the speaking that's involved. When the president gives a talk on, on television uh, to the nation, there may be emotional factors involved if, if we were about to go to war or something like that, but in most cases it's much more related to information. Why income taxes are changing, why policy to relative to this set or, or a variety of other countries is changing and so forth. It's the, the spoken message that is much more important, the informational content that is more important. So, so it, it could be argued, others have estimated essentially that 60 to 70 percent of most messages is conveyed other than emotionally. That is, it's conveyed by the meaning of the words that is being used in, in the message message itself. So, so people tend to get blown away by that particular breakdown, but that's applied only when you've got an emotional exchange that's going on in a given situation. Um, we can summarize all this by a, a series of general principles which were well presented in, in your textbook. Uh, but keep in mind that this one has to do with emotional messages only. Um, and what, we'd, what we would summarize here is to argue that essentially nonverbal communication um, is multi-channel. Multi um, it's sometimes uh, literally oozing out of every pore of our body in a given uh, exchange of, of information here. Um, and the, the um, verbal communication is, is limited to just one channel, not so with nonverbal communication. There's a lot of difference between hi and hi. That's telling something very different non-verbally, and that's one of those things that, that, uh, that, that oozes out of us all the time. Um, have you ever tried to listen to two conversations at the same time? It is essentially impossible to do, and that's exactly the same reason why things like slips of the tongue occur. In some cases, what we're trying to do is phrase something to a given person when we know inside that we're trying to say something different. 
and sometimes it'll leak out on us because you've got that conversation going on with yourself and at the same time you've got the one that you're offering to the to the person with whom you're interacting and if they're not one-on-one -on -one, uh, there are going to be occasions where errors from one will leap over and impact what you're saying in the other uh, in the other kind of situation um, nonverbal factors usually communicate emotions okay in fact, it may be almost impossible to keep ourselves from relaying various kind of, of uh, emotional information. For instance, we sit close to those we love, we touch them more often, we look at them more often than those we don't love, and so forth. So a lot of nonverbal communication goes on. You may not even be aware of it when it's occurring in a given situation. It's also largely spontaneous. The conversation we can control, we can keep it on a given subject, but the, the, um, the nonverbal aspect is, is typically viewed as, as being spontaneous. And the result is the nonverbal communication is often viewed as, as a more gut level or genuine reaction to what somebody is really trying to say to you in a given situation. And finally then, the, uh, the nonverbal communication is also independent of the verbal communication itself. It may reaffirm or in some cases it will contradict the verbal message itself because it's largely uncontrolled. It, it may be a better gauge of what somebody is really trying to say to you in a, um, in a given situation. Um, and now I'm at one of these awkward points where I'm kind of near a stopping point and not quite yet, so let me see if we can just uh, wrap it up here in, in the following kind of way. And that is to say that one of the other things that is important to understand is that nonverbal communication is essentially culture bound. Um, we made the, the comment earlier that a Middle Easterner, for example, can back a Westerner into a corner because the distance at which they stand in, in, um, in casual conversations is much closer than the window that is, is acceptable for Westerners. So people who get too close to us tend to back us up, and that'll happen in any given society. We'll talk about the, we'll wrap up the last types of nonverbal communication in the next lecture.